Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the War for Badab. Last episode, it seemed as if Lufthuron had acquired everything he had ever wanted. He had gained a great deal of new powerful friends after intervening in the Fourth Quadrant Rebellion, leading a brilliant military campaign to crush the uprising of rebels in yet another Imperial Autonomous Zone. This, in turn, gained him a favorable alliance with the Black Templars chapter, and allowed him to launch his long-waited-for campaign to seize the Maelstrom Warp Storm Zone. But then, everything went so terribly wrong so terribly quickly. With the Black Templars being called away to other battlefronts across an Imperium, ever more besieged by external forces, and with the warders themselves ragged, torn, and much reduced after the Crusade of Wrath, and without any Imperial aid coming to their rescue, they were now left with a stark choice to fight and possibly risk extermination whilst holding on to the gains made, or retreat once more to consolidate within the Autonomous Zone and thusly admit defeat. Huron raged at the idea of any such retreat, and was abhorrent to even suggest it. His brothers had bled for these worlds they had captured, he had bled for them. The Crusade of Wrath was the culmination of decades of careful, intricate, and ambitious military planning, as well as laborious and extended high-level political talks and extensive diplomatic efforts. The gains made by the Warders simply could not be abandoned so easily. And so far, whilst the rest of the Imperium was beleaguered, the Maelstrom Autonomous Zone was, as of yet, still stable. Huron even allowed himself a precious moment of hope that it might all remain that way. <laughs> a chapter master of the Adeptus Astartes should know better. As chaos, confusion, death, and destruction spread across the Imperium, the powers of chaos began to grow once more. The Great Eye grew greater still. And along with it, the Maelstrom Warp Storm Zone also slowly but inexorably began to expand and afflict itself upon an ever greater area of space. Warp travel, never an easy task within the Autonomous Zone even during the best of days, grew more and more unstable. Previously safe routes became subject to sudden squalls and storms, throwing ships off course, and many were affected by far more insidious phenomenons. Ghost hulks prowling the depth, bringing madness and death to any crew unlucky enough to come across them. And as travel in the Autonomous Zone became ever more dangerous and untrustworthy, the strong winds of the Immaterium began to blow out of the Warp Storm Zone, allowing those nefarious inhabitants who yet remained to travel faster and deeper into the Autonomous Zone than for centuries before. The galactic Mott and Bailey, constructed out of burned and destroyed husk planets by Lift Huron during his Exterminatus program, grew narrower and narrower and narrower until having shrunk away almost entirely. The raiding party is easily able to simply skip across it on the increased winds. If this was the only malady to affect the Autonomous Zone, however, Huron could have dealt with it. The Tyrant's Guard were now a well-trained, well-organized, well-entrenched and deployed army. They were an elite force more than capable of challenging any piratical raiding group. And almost as if on cue, word then arrived of a far greater threat. 
in the Endymion Cluster, the part of the Autonomous Zone that had long been the ancestral homeland of the Mantis Warriors, the green-skinned danger had arisen once more. An extensive series of orc invasions up and down the cluster were the very first indications of a gargantuan orc warg incoming. In size and scope, it would eventually be revealed that this invasion force was far larger even than the one that had cut so deep into the Autonomous Zone as to reach Badab itself during the tenure of Rovik Blake. This was not a menace that the Tyrant Guard, however well trained, equipped and organized they were, could face by themselves. The Warders would have to return, and they would have to do so in their full strength. This in essence meant abandoning all the gains made during the Crusade of Wrath. Huron put every ounce of his logistical talent to scrounging together whatever PDF troops, whatever spare Imperial Guard formations or Tyrant's legions he could, and sent them off to the fringes. But ultimately, it was nothing more than half measures. Much reduced Imperial Guard regiments considered too weak to face the Orcs, poorly trained PDF and fresh half-formed legions, Whilst they would march whatever their tyrant demanded, once they got there they had little choice but to slowly wither and die, on inhospitable planets, in hostile systems, far from reinforcements or reliable supplies. Huron had meant to maintain the frontiers with his chapters, whilst the slow spread of Imperial civilization crept in, while stable warp routes were discovered and stores of supplies delivered. Now all he could do was throw mere mortals at a job intended for superhumans, and witness the slow yet inevitable outcome. However, Huron was not giving up just yet. He had proven himself repeatedly to be a military genius. If he could only smash the orcs quickly enough, halt their forward momentum at least and establish a solid front in the Endymion Cluster, then perhaps he could turn around and race back to the fringes, reinforce the troops located there, and somehow reach some form of stability between the two fronts having half of his chapters dealing with the orcs, having the other half dealing with the fringes. If he could just mobilize enough strength to hold the line, he might be able to squeak out a victory. But no sooner had he began to see a path towards that salvation, than word arrived from the Pale Stars. Massive cult uprisings had occurred across multiple populated worlds and mining outposts. And with the speed of wildfire, the uprisings began to spread all across the Autonomous Zone. It would seem that even under the tyrant's harsh grasp, Chaos cultists had still been able to grow, thrive and fester in Imperial society and they had chosen this moment to rise up on Mars. Even near the heart of Huron's mini-empire, the Badag Sector, rumors began to circulate of dark forces planning ill and malicious deeds against their warder masters. Just a single year or two previously, this would not have been a threat. But with the bulk of the Tyrant's legions and the chapters deployed against the Orcs in the Endymion Cluster, and the second and third line formations dispatched in a desperate ploy to maintain stability in the newly conquered reaches of the Warp Storm Zone, there were precious few armed and trained men left behind to guard what was supposed to be the home front. Crises would continue to stack upon crises, disaster upon disaster, peril followed menace, uncertainty and vulnerability spread across the entirety of the Autonomous Zone. 
And as one final little indicator of the horrors that were to come, the chief seers of the Maelstrom Warders, after having consulted the Empress Tarot, came back with omens of destruction and annihilation, of dangers as of yet unforetold, creeping slowly into the autonomous zone. Finally, at long last, and after much vehement resistance, Huron surrendered to the ever-increasing pressure of his counselors and ordered a general withdrawal from all territories conquered during the Crusade of Wrath. He was to consolidate within the autonomous zone and try to hold on to the slipping strings of his empire. He had found himself in a position disturbingly similar to that of his predecessor, and it must have frustrated him to no end. It is difficult to even imagine what goes through the mind of a superhuman warrior, a genius by all accounts that holds the lives of billions in one hand and the military might to conquer dozens of planets in the other, and yet finds himself entirely impotent to stop the scattered, fragmented pieces of his once great empire from crashing down all around him. All the work Lufthuron had put into building this edifice to humanity, the better part of a century's worth of labour, not only on his own part, but that of his chapter, his warders, the millions of men under his command, and the billions of civilians, all of it being chipped away and eroded by the inexorable grind of history and disaster. After having issued, undoubtedly, the single most excruciating order in his entire military career, the order to withdraw, Luft Huron withdrew himself to Badab Primaris, where he locked himself away in his private wing of the Palace of Thorns, not to be seen again by anyone but palace servants for many, many months. It is an interesting question, again, is it not, what goes through the mind of a man like Lufthuron during times like this? An undisputed prodigy, one of the god emperors chosen, who had proven himself thoroughly deserving of his title of chapter master, the kind of man who only comes around every thousand years. And then, of course, there is the fact that he was not just a man, he was an Astartes, an essentially immortal demigod enhanced far beyond regular humanity in every single way. What must he have been thinking? <sighs> it's hard enough for one of us mere mortals when we see one of our designs, our ideas dashed upon the merciless rocks of fate. You get fired from your job. It may seem like the end of the world for many. Your business fails. It's a nightmare. A friend or loved one passes away. <laughs> for Huron, not only had he seen the deaths of dozens of friends and brothers, if not hundreds in the crusade, he had seen the labors of a century being crushed, in galactic terms, overnight and there was absolutely nothing he could do to stop it. He had thousands of space marines under his command, hundreds of warships, thousands of worlds, millions if not billions of men under arms, and the economy of an entire sector. And he had used it all, and the best he could possibly hope for was a return to the status quo over a hundred years past. If I was to hazard a guess at what was passing through Huron's mind at that very point in time, anger, disappointment, blame, hatred, and not a little bit of sorrow would probably be my guesses. And whilst it might be easy to imagine and perhaps even expect that 
a manus far removed from general humanity as Luft Huron, a superhuman space marine. Their feelings, their mind would be alien, right? Because they're not traditional humanity. They're not like you and I. But if history is any guide, then rather than being inhumane in their feelings, their opinions, their emotions, I think it would be safer to say that the Astartes tend towards not being less human, but a more extreme magnification of humanity, all of its good parts, and yes, also all of its bad parts. With Huron locking himself away in the Palace of Thorns to brood over the disasters that had befallen him, the unfair treatment at the hands of the Adeptus Administratum, and the complete and utter absence of all aid from the outside, I think it's safe to assume that within the Chapter Master of the Astral Clause, the negative parts were growing. Still, no matter how dire the situation may be within the Autonomous Zone, the rest of the Imperium would go on regardless. And as they oft say, one man's emergency is another's opportunity. And lost within all the fighting, all of the expanding, all of the conquests, the orc invasions and the cultist activity, was the legal matter that the Maelstrom Warders were still involved in with the Higher Lords of the Administratum and the Lords of the Cartago sector. Now with everything you've just heard, it must sound rather petty, right? To quarrel about tithes and taxes and produce now. The Autonomous Zone was tipping on the edge of the abyss and yet the High Lords of the Administratum will more worry about stuffing their coffers. But bear in mind, the Imperium is a very large place, and the entire economies of certain sectors and subsectors and solar systems are entirely dependent upon the produce of others. In the case of the Autonomous Zones, there were many, 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 many more worlds in the Imperium that relied upon its constant flow of resources and manufactured goods than there were planets within the Autonomous Zone itself. And after having been deprived of all of those goods for decades upon decades, is there any wonder? that they started getting quite sick of it? Is there any wonder that they might think, you know what, our economy is collapsing, I really don't care what's happening over in the Autonomous Zone, hundreds of light years and many months of warp travel over there. They've made their bed, and now we will get what is ours. One of the main weaknesses of the various injured parties in the blockade was that the Lords of the Cartago sector were a disparate and scattered lot. They had, as I have previously mentioned, grown far too fat and complacent of the rich bounty flowing out of the Autonomous Zone. The various noble houses had seized almost complete control of the entire sector, and they were far more busy quarrelling and fighting with one another than they were engaging in imperial politics in large. Which incidentally is precisely how the Imperium likes it. The more the little fish are concerned with om nom nomming one another, the less attention they pay to the business of the larger fishies. When resources grow scarce, though, and life becomes harder, Cartago could no longer support as many lords and ladies as it could previously. The competition ceased being a playful fight between equals and rivals, honourable jousting back and forth, and became something altogether more cutthroat.
Soon power blocks began emerging, alliances were formed, and no longer were defeated houses granted mercy in a stay of execution only to rise again later. Now, things were all a little bit more permanent, as strength needed to be gathered under single individual leaders, so that the Cartago sector could push their claims to the Lords of the Administratum with increased and single-minded vigour. Left standing at the end, at the top of a pile of fine, distinguished aristocratic corpses, was a single noble lady by the name of Tarnit Koenig. Having proven herself the most cold-blooded, merciless and ruthless of all of Carthage's ruling nobility, she was now de facto Mistress Cartago, supreme ruler of the entire Carthage sector. There were still noble houses left, representatives, dignitaries, and those of gentle birth, to provide an illusion of the good old days, of a continuation of power. She'd even allowed a few competing rival houses to survive as well, just to provide the illusion of competition. Whilst in reality, all took their orders now from one single master. And she meant to pit herself against the infamous tyrant of Badab, first and foremost, in a legal and political sense. After the procreator general had become rather angry with Cartago for not handing over their usual tithes, the sector had sent representatives to the High Lords. Well, of course, they argued that they could not possibly be expected to live up to their obligations because the resources they were supposed to be distributing had simply not arrived. Of course, it wasn't quite that simple, and whilst Huron was engaged in quashing the Fourth Quadrant Rebellion and preparing for the Crusade of Wrath, Tarnit Koenig and her underlings had been waging an equally ferocious decades-long legal battle, dragging forth ancient, dusty requirements, obligations, privileges, rights, and treaties of ownership and duty. To boil hundreds of thousands of pages of dense legal documentation down to a single point, the representatives of the Cartago sector claimed that since the Autonomous Zone was an Autonomous Zone and therefore not a part of the Imperium of Man, any claim that it had to the resources through a blockade were null and void. Only the Cartago sector, in their power and position as an Imperial sector, had any legitimate claim on the zone's resources and manufacturing goods. This legal challenge had of course not passed Huron entirely by, but he had bigger things to worry about, and had dispatched the usual delegations of diplomats, lawyers and dignitaries, who argued of course that it was ridiculous. The Autonomous Zone may be autonomous, but it was imperial. It was imperial territory protected by the God Emperor's very own Space Marines. Unfortunately for them, this was becoming as much of a political question as it was a legal or an economical one. Huron and the Warders had a lot of adversaries amongst the High Lords and the political class of Terra. Furthermore, the Anti-Warders Alliance had received a fresh addition to their ranks. The Adeptus Mechanicus Biologius, who had up until this point remained neutral in the dispute, had still not received their regularly scheduled shipments of gene seed samples from the Warders chapters. And it had been a long time indeed.
Now, such shipments can be delayed, they can be waylaid, it may even, in certain instances, be impossible or unreasonable to expect a chapter to offer up one of its most precious resources during certain trying times. But the Mechanicus's patience has its limits, and they have long since been broken in this scenario. Now, of course, the absence of tribute does not necessarily mean anything, but considering it is one of the duties of the Mechanicus to check for imperfections, for mutation and corruption in the gene seed samples, this was plentiful circumstantial evidence for the enemies of the Warders. The case had seemed like, for a very long time, to be simply one of those legal disputes in the Imperium that is started by one generation, and then the hundredth generation thereafter will have to hire their own lawyers simply just to figure out what the case was even about in the first place. But this had been a game changer with the judges now beginning to lean heavily in favor of the Cartago sector, Tarnith Koenig saw her opportunity to act and to try and force the Warder's hand. The operation that Tarnith Koenig came up with was very representative of just how dire the situation had become to be in the Cartago sector. They needed the wealth of the Autonomous Zone, and they needed it yesterday. Under normal circumstances, such a hazardous undertaking would not even have been entertained as an idea, but again, these were not normal circumstances. Tarnit Koenig would amass a fleet, a tithe fleet and dispatch it along with as many high-ranking representatives as she could get her hands on to force the Warders of the Maelstrom, three Astartes chapters and the Tyrant of Badab, in command of millions if not billions of fanatically loyal troops, to hand over their tithes. Oh boy. <laughs> Threatening a Space Marine Chapter Master. A bold move, certainly, but there were indications that it was not a hopeless one, with the judges again beginning to lean in the direction of the Cartago sector, Tarnit Koenig had acquired a series of high-value emissaries. The Tithe Fleet would contain Lords of the Cartago Sector, obviously, an Administratum Assayer General, representatives of the Adeptus Mechanicus Biologus, and an Inquisitor. Tarnit Koenig had not risen to the top of the Cartago Sector for nothing. This was a rather ingenious plan. She would mix in her own demands for resources alongside and undistinguishable from those of the Administratum, the Mechanicus, and the Inquisition, hoping therefore to provide the Warders with a stark choice. Either they would have to hand over all the demanded wealth, or risk making an enemy out of the Administratum, the Mechanicus, and the Inquisition in one fell swoop. The political threat inherent in such a move was obvious and blatantly visible to all, intentionally so, whereas the military threat needed to be understated, implied, but not clear and therefore the Tithe fleet was given a minimal escort. Enough to deter pirates and raiders, but not enough to be seen as any kind of a threat by the warders of the Maelstrom. Tarnit Koenig undoubtedly knowing that in any kind of confrontation, she would draw the shortest straw. In normal times of such 
difficulty and turbulence, a tithe fleet would warrant a considerable military escort, possibly even a capital ship or a grand cruiser at the head. Instead, this one was led by three regular cruisers, and a single Mechanicus Locus Caravel, and a handful of smaller escorts, frigates, and destroyers. Leaving the Imperial Navy warship elements of the Tithe fleet quite outnumbered by the mass conveyors and transports that they were escorting. Very unusual to be certain. The largest mass conveyors used by the Imperium can measure up to 12 kilometers in length, and is more than capable of transporting up to 500,000 human cargo or millions of tons of tightly packed raw resources. A single one of these ships can collect an entire solar system's worth of tribute and return back to whence it came. But for all their impressive size, the transports are de facto defenseless. All the energies produced by its multiple plasma cores redirected into the behemoth engines pushing this literal mountain of metal and produce through the void, not to mention the Geller Field generators required to cover a vessel 12 kilometers in length and half a dozen in height. The capture of even a single one of these giants would ensure that an entire pirate clan was set for life, and the news that a convoy of these things large enough to gather decades worth of overdue tithes from all across the autonomous zone were heading in, escorted by a measly three cruisers and a Mechanicus vessel, that would have drawn quite a bit of attention. Furthermore, the target of the Tithe fleet was at the very heart of the Autonomous Zone, the Badab Sector and the capital of the Tyrant, and as the Orcs demonstrated so many years ago, that lay well within striking range of the storm, even before its increased activity. It's all starting to sound like a very unsafe undertaking, doesn't it? And it absolutely was as well. Undoubtedly, considering the response the Tithe Fleet would eventually receive as well, it must have been carried out under a blanket of near complete secrecy, with only those with the absolute need to know being instructed as to the direction and the eventual target of the Tithe fleet. Taking into consideration the highly limited nature of the fleet's escort, this was in all due likelihood simple operational necessity. The Maelstrom adjacent resource extraction grid was, as I have mentioned on multiple occasions now, not a safe place and anything that went on within its borders was under the iron control of the warders, of the tyrant's legion, and the various administrative dignitaries of the planets in question. Everything had to be scrutinized, everything had to be guarded, and strict security measures were in place across the entirety of the zone. This was absolutely necessary. Pirates were everywhere, smugglers, raiders, heretics, infiltrators, near-do-wells, and secessionist elements were a constant threat across the entirety of the Autonomous Zone, and even more so in the last couple of years since the increased activity from the Maelstrom Warp Storm Zone and nowhere were the security measures stricter than in the Ring of Steel, the series of orbital defense platforms constructed by the Tyrant to defend the Badab system, a huge series of orbital defense platforms, torpedo silos, and laser batteries. <laughs> 
It was designed to be nearly impenetrable, and capable of picking up on even the smallest craft attempting entry into the Badab sector. Obviously then, the arrival of three cruiser-class warships, an Adeptus Mechanicus vessel, along with several escorts and massive transports, were immediately picked up on and hailed by Badab Defense Control. The incoming Tithe fleet was ordered to heave to, cut power to all engines, and prepared to be boarded, both for the purposes of general inspections and for pilots to come aboard and guide the vessels through the Ring of Steel only after they had been fully certified. But the Tithe fleet made absolutely no indication that it was going to obey Badab defense control. A communique, quite to the contrary, shot back from the Administratum Bark Quasi Lambda, ordering Badab defense control to stand down, immediately disengage all weapons locks, and prepare for the Administratum's delegation in the name of him on terror. What followed was a frantic series of communiques shooting back and forth over the course of the next few minutes. Badab Defense Control insisting ever more firmly the Tithe Fleet must halt and power down all engines and weapons immediately or be fired upon. And in return, the Quasi Lambda shot back that any offensive action would be viewed as an immediate declaration of war on the authority of the God Emperor of Mankind. Then, as tensions escalated quicker and quicker, someone fired a single lance shot. In the fraction of a millisecond it took the beam of weaponized energy to reach its targets, thousands of sensors scattered throughout the Ring of Steel had registered and tracked it. Weapon discharge had been confirmed within the Ring of Steel. Badab Primaris was under threat and automated emergency response procedures were activated. Thousands of laser batteries, hundreds of torpedo silos, and millions of laser kill mines went live and locked on the Tithe fleet. The whole sorry mess was over in less than 13 minutes, with the complete obliteration of the Joint Cartago and Administratum Tithe Fleet. 20,000 men and women of the Imperial Navy were dead, along with the Adeptus Mechanicus contingent and one single Inquisitor. Meanwhile, in Badab Defense Command, a state of complete shock and confusion was still reigning. They were still not sure who they had fired upon, or why the automated defences had kicked in without direct authorization. A weapon discharge had been reported, but in all the confusion immediately thereafter, as the entire Ring of Steel opened up and obliterated the incoming, unidentified fleet of theoretical assailants, no one knew where the shot had come from. The leading theory at the time was that it must have been some sort of a trick, a ploy, an attempt by piratical raiders, by secessionists, maybe even by rebel elements, remnants of the crushed nobles during the Badab uprising, to launch an invasion of Badab. They had pretended to be Imperial vessels to get close to the Ring of Steel, and then launch a surprise attack. But the reaction speed of the defences were quicker than they had anticipated, and so the entire engagement had ended before it had even begun. This was the Autonomous Zone after all. Such a scenario was not only plausible, it was the most likely explanation. When patrol craft were dispatched, however, to investigate the wreckage, the destroyed fleet was positively identified as Imperial. And more precisely, according to the covered data logs as Imperial Tithe Fleet VX542-11. And now, 
panic started to replace the feeling of general confusion that had enveloped Badab defense control. BDC insisted that they had not fired the first shot. They claimed that one of their system defense frigates had been fired upon first and had received extensive engine damage after which the automated defense systems of the BDC activated as they were intended to do. Furthermore, the BDC also insisted that they had sought permission to abort the retaliatory strikes, but by the time any of this had been communicated, weapons were already firing, and the Tithe fleet, regardless of whether or not it fired first or second, would at this point undoubtedly have attempted to defend itself. After which point, it was no longer a border enforcement action, an inspection or a control, it was a void battle. And considering the difference in firepower, it was a very short one and a very one-sided one. The BDC report then concluded that by the time the correct authorizations could be acquired and the abort signals inputted and sent out, the tie of the fleet was no more. Standing by his men, Luft Huron thusly adopted this as the Badab sector's official response to the incident. Whereas, of course, in Carthago sector, upon learning of the destruction of the Tithe fleet, Tanit Koenig flew into a rage of her own. Condemning the warders in these most strident possible terms, she marshaled her considerable influence amongst the lords of both Carthago and other nearby sectors, and sent a demand directly to Terra and the High Lords for the warders not only to be punished, but for the arrest of Lufthuron. The charge, she stated, was the outright murder of 20,000 loyal imperial citizens and the dismissal of a rightful administratum decree. Even the Adeptus Mechanicus, once more traditionally neutral in these things, sent their own complaints as well. Magos Invigila petitioned the Adepts of Mars to punish the Astral Claws as well after the destruction of the Mechanicus vessel but the minds of the High Lords were occupied elsewhere. The queue of petitioners seeking their attention, miles long at the best of times, had now grown into new and near unknown proportions. The Imperium was under attack from every direction, and whilst the High Lords initially had been quite interested in the Maelstrom Zone, it was now quickly becoming little more than a minor border inconvenience between otherwise loyal Imperial citizens, and it is Imperial policy to not intervene in local affairs. Tarnet Koenig and her fellow Cartago lords were thusly informed that whilst the destruction of the Tithe fleet was a grave and unfortunate matter, the Imperium could not take a stance in this case at the moment, and they urged Cartago to find a solution to the problem on their end, and also reminded them of the outstanding tithes still expected of the Cartago sector. And right here, I think it is time for a little bit of an intermission, Inquisitor to Inquisitor, because the situation is a bit more complex than it might at first seem. Tarnit Koenig's dispatch of a tithe fleet into the Autonomous Zone was a high-risk, high-reward gamble. Should the warders step down, Cartago would be allowed access once more to the riches of the Maelstrom, all Cartago really cared about. And should the warders stand firm and deny the Tithe fleet, surely the worst that could happen was that they were rejected, right? That the adepts and the envoys of the administratum, of the Mechanicus and the Inquisition were spurned, humiliated and sent away, 
right? Which would of course serve Tarnit Koenig's intentions almost as well as fully laden tithe ships. I do not think for a moment that Tarnig could ever have imagined the warders would actually destroy the fleet. A fleet not only with, again, Mechanicus elements, Imperial Navy elements, Administratum officials, and an Inquisitor. To destroy such representatives would have been next to madness, frankly. But that is of course a matter of the heightened security of the Maelstrom adjacent resource extraction grid. It had always been high, and it had only ever been heightened since the tyrant took command. And surely Tarnit must have understood this, right? After all, if a man fires a warning shot in the air and orders you to stop, you stop, right? Well. The people of the Cartago sector viewed the Maelstrom as the frontier, barbarian territory practically, not really a part of the great glorious Imperium at all. And for a member of the very uppermost elites of this sector, it would not surprise me in the slightest to learn that Tarnit Koenig had never paid much in the way of attention to the Autonomous Zone at all. It wouldn't even shock me much if someone told me that she didn't even know it possessed orbital defences. She probably envisioned that the Tithe fleet would bully itself into high orbit with the political authority at its command and the presence of the Inquisitor. Then it would deploy its emissaries, its advocates and its delegates as the odious little shits they were to go make the life of some badab functionary miserable. Perhaps the fact that the Tithe fleet did not bother announcing its intentions before arriving in the Badab system was yet further evidence of Koenig's real intentions. Figuring that the fleet would arrive, and dispatch its emissaries, use their political authority and power to requisition whatever resources were on hand, and then make off again like bandits before the tyrant even knew what was happening. After all, what would some local Badab administrator do when faced with an Assayer General, an Inquisitor, and a High Magos all demanding the tithes be released? Immediately, he would surely just cave in then and there, surely. Now, of course, I am not saying that Tarnit Koenig's plan wasn't reckless. Oh, yeah, it was in the extreme as well, to even think that you could potentially bully the chapter master of the Adeptus Astartes on his own capital world in his own sector? <laughs> the sheer brass balls on this woman are impressive indeed, but I am saying that she probably would never again have expected that it would have ended like this. It really was an extreme outlayer scenario, brought about by, well, several tragically predictable consequences. One, Badab Primaris was in a state of heightened alert. The sectors nearby had shown signs of uprising and general chaotic heretical upheaval. The Endymion Cluster was under mass orc assault. The tyrant himself was in the Pals of Thorns right then and there, sulking after his retreat orders. Of course they would have very, very itchy trigger fingers indeed during such circumstances. One of the fragments of the communication that occurred between the BDC and the Tithe fleet has a controller stating has one, has one of the BDC controllers shouting into his Vox apparatus, This is the Maelstrom Zone, not some safe haven quill pushers enclave, trying to impress upon them that you can't simply just barge in here because they don't know who you are. They don't know what you are. <laughs> 
Imagine, for example, if even just a single one of the tie of the fleet's massive transports was loaded down with explosives. If it was allowed within the Ring of Steel, best case scenario, it could cripple a defense platform. Worst case, it could slam itself into Badab Primaris and delete entire hive cities off the map. And again, this is the Maelstrom Zone. Shit like that happens. Though again, there is plenty of blame to go around in this little disaster. There is plenty of blame for Tarnit Koenig. There is plenty of blame for the bombastic Assayer General aboard the Quace Lambda, trying to force his way in to one of the most heavily defended systems in the Imperium. And there is plenty blame as well on the BDC for not having disengaged their automated defences earlier. But as is so often the case, with such little sparks that eventually turn into conflagrations, neither of the sides were overly interested in taking on any of the blame for themselves and would much rather push all of it over onto the opposition. The tyrant was not in the mood for negotiation, and Tarnit Koenig, having staked her position, her career, authority and prestige on all of this, on bringing an end to the blockade, she had no room to back down now either. And so the tables were set for only one outcome. Only one possibility, escalation. From both Cartago Sector and the Warders. But that will have to wait until the next episode. Until then, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.